Good morning, everyone. I got to say it again. He is risen. He's risen indeed. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us. If we haven't met, my name's Phil, the lead pastor here. And um, I just want to spend a few minutes noticing a couple things in this beautiful scene that we've just heard in John chapter 20. And at the outset, I just want us to notice where the first Easter begins. The story actually does not begin in a play of place of, of joy and triumph. It begins in a graveyard with a weeping woman named Mary. And I'm just wondering as we come and gather today, if that's a context with which some of us can relate. And, and I wonder if some of us come today and we're carrying some grief and we're feeling some disorientation. Perhaps you felt a little dissonance in your heart as you sang some songs of triumph while you are trying to reckon with experiences and feelings of defeat. And if that is how you come, friends, you are in good company. (laughs) Easter belongs to you. You belong in the story. The first Easter begins in a graveyard with a weeping woman named Mary. I have to admit, I've been feeling some of that dissonance myself this week as I've been preparing a sermon about resurrection and hope. I've simultaneously been carrying a number of stories of pain, stories of cancer and chronic illness and major surgery, stories of relational strain. And those are just some of the stories in our small little community here that doesn't account for the the bigger anxiety a lot of us carry as we look upon a world at war, a world full of injustice and political turmoil. What I want to begin with today is reclaim this day for those of us who feel that dissonance. The story begins in a graveyard with a weeping woman named Mary, but it does not end there. Mary initially struggles to see signs of hope. Her eyes are so clouded by grief that she misses the signs of of new life in her midst. And yet, as the story unfolds, somehow she journeys through her grief, not around it, not away from it, through her despair and grief to a new vision of hope. And I want to just notice how that change happens for Mary and how that turn, that change, that shift might happen for us. As Mary journeys from despair to hope, I I think it begins by the fact that she stays at the tomb. Notice that she stays there. The other disciples, after seeing the empty tomb, quickly scan the situation and they run. But Mary remains. She stays there. She explores. She seeks to discover what's going on. And I think this might be instructive for us. I I, I know I have an instinct like Peter to want to run away from the graveyards of life, run away from the hard things, the disorienting things. But Mary, by staying there, opens herself up to new discoveries. And I wonder if the invitation for some of us today is simply to stay with the hard questions, to continue look, to look deeper in the midst of those places where we are disoriented. Mary stays at the tomb, and as she stays there, she is then given space to process her grief. Both the angels and Jesus pose this very profound question to her as they say, Woman, why are you crying? And I want to suggest to you, friends, that we need to read this not as a rebuke, but as an invitation, as an invitation to lament. One of my mentors, Trevor Hudson, writes this, Jesus' question to Mary reminds us that tears are okay. Tears reflect the fact that we are vulnerable, fallible, and fragile human beings. Jesus knew this only too well. In his Sermon on the Mount, he pronounced a special blessing on those who mourn. He himself was no stranger to tears. When he saw the grief of Mary and Martha for their brother Lazarus, he also wept. This is not a rebuke. This is an invitation. Jesus isn't saying, cheer up, Mary. It's Easter Sunday. Be strong. No. Mary, why are you crying? And as she has space to lament and name what is behind her tears, I believe she is able to discover and find a deeper hope. A quote that I've referenced before that I come back to often by theologian Chris Rice says that to the extent that our lament is shallow, our hope will be shallow. If our lament is shallow, our hope will be shallow. We will not find a deeper resolution to the pain of this world if we do not first name the problem 
and expose what is wrong with this world. And this question affords Mary that space to lament. And it's part of her journey to hope. And so I wonder if the invitation for some of us is to maybe sit with this question as we begin this Easter journey. Why are you crying? What grief are you carrying with you today? Are you grieving loss or failure or pain or rejection? May we have the courage to sit with this question. But as Mary continues and turns around and encounters Jesus, we begin that, to see that she, she sees some signs of hope. And grief is not the end of her story. She begins to see that there is a bigger spiritual reality that she missed at first. She initially mistakes Jesus for the gardener. This thought that Jesus would be alive just doesn't fit within her theoretical framework. I think we sometimes wrongly assume that ancient people just expected resurrection. They were pre-scientific, unsophisticated thinkers. This was uh, out of her realm of what she thought was plausible, and so she missed it. She did not see the startling reality. It's interesting that the verb used uh, in this passage for Peter and Mary, when it says they looked into the tomb, it's this Greek word theria, which is where we get the word to theorize. And there's a place for, for theorizing and thinking, but I think what happens is that Peter scans the scene, and in his human theories, he thinks that this is the end of the story, and so he runs. <laughs> you see, the, the mystery of God is not fitting within the limits of human theorizing, and I think what the Easter story invites us to do is expand our horizons, open our minds to a deeper possibility, a deeper mystery. As modern listeners, I think we're so quick to rule out the transcendent, so quick to rule out the possible possibility of resurrection, yet the Easter story calls us to expand our horizons, to expand what one sociologist calls our plausibility structures. In the Enlightenment world, we have just narrowed our view of what's plausible to this naturalistic, imminent frame. And the Easter story says, that's not big enough to make sense of the deeper reality. Open your horizons to what is plausible. What Easter asks of us is this. It asks us to consider that the God who is big enough to create this world, this miracle that we are living in now, is big enough to do it again. Is it that hard to believe in the possibility of new creation when we live the miracle of creation? What the Easter story asks of us is is to expand our our imagination and, and believe that the God who once before out of nothing created being, created this world, and simply promises to do that again, that out of death a new realm of life will emerge. Easter causes us, calls us to step out in faith and trust that the same God who made us can mend us. Can we open our mind to the possibility that we haven't seen the whole story? You know, this is really the central message that runs through John 20. John 20 has all kinds of echoes back to the original creation story. When you dig deeper and see how the gospel writer put together the scene, you see the beauty of what he's doing. When you look deeper, you see that this is actually creation 2.0. This is the start of new creation. Notice where our text began. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Does this sound like something familiar? Do you hear the echo back to Genesis 1-1, where on the first day, darkness hovered over the world? We see a cue that this is day one of new creation. And all the, the echoes back to creation keep coming. We see that Mary mistakens Jesus for the gardener. Of course he looks like a gardener. Jesus is planting seeds of new creation in the graveyards of life. He is this gardener seeking to till and bring about new creation. One writer puts it this way, John wants to see a connection between the Garden of Eden and Jesus rising from the dead in a garden. There is a new Adam on the scene, and he is reversing the cause of death by conquering it, and he's doing it in a garden. 
We could go on, and we're going to spend some time in John 20 over the next couple weeks. But as you go a few verses later, you see that Jesus then breathes upon his disciples the Holy Spirit. Do you hear a shout back to when God first breathed life into Adam and Eve? Here we have God breathing new life into his believers. Friends, there's an invitation to see the hope <clears throat> of new creation. The same God that made us has come to mend us. And I just wonder where you might, if you look deeper, see signs of new creation emerging out of the various graveyards of this world. Can we have eyes to see it? We are so trained, I think, to direct our gaze to what is broken and what is fearful. We live in a media ecosystem that causes us to look in that direction. Fear is good for business and it's good for politics, and that's what we look at. And we are not called to deny it. We are, we're called to engage it. New creation is not fully realized. We still reckon with the realities of the fall. But if we look deeper, and if we engage in the practice of praise and gratitude, I believe we will see signs of new creation growing among us. Where have you seen those signs? The poet Elizabeth Bear Browning says, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. <laughs> Elizabeth Bear Browning wants us to have our eyes open to a deeper reality. Look for the ways that earth is crammed with heaven, and the way that we can begin to see that and not simply just go about our world and ignore the deeper story is to take off our shoes and realize that we are on holy ground. And so I wonder if you might be on the lookout for the signs of new life that are emerging from the graveyard in your life. Where have you seen that? This is what Mary sees, and it helps her turn from despair to hope. She sees a bigger story being written. The resurrected Christ has come to make things new. Well, the last thing I want to notice, though, is that Mary doesn't just see this new reality. She then is told that she will have a place and a role in this new creation. God is not just this impersonal being who is powerful, but he is also a personal being who knows Mary by name. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. This is what opens her eyes when Jesus calls her by name. Friends, we have a God who is all-powerful, but also all-loving. He is the good shepherd who knows his sheep, and I believe he calls out to you by name. And says, you will have a place in this new creation. You will have a role in participating with me in bringing about redemption and hope in this world. Mary is now commissioned. She is sent out as a missionary. Friends, the gospel is never just Jesus and me. It is Jesus and mission. And so she is sent with a word of hope to her brothers, her fellow disciples. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Do you hear the grace in this message she has given? She is now going to go to those disciples who have just denied and betrayed and failed miserably and said, Jesus calls you brother. <laughs> he invites you into the family. You are not just servants. You're not even just friends anymore. You are family. And Mary is now commissioned as a missionary to speak words of hope over these beloved friends of hers. I just wonder how God might want to use us to sow some of these seeds of new creation in a hurting world. I believe he sends us out into this world with messages of compassion to those who feel as if their story is over. Might we lift people up with our words in a world where people just seem to cut people down with their words? I believe we can sow seeds of new creation with every act of compassion and justice and care for those in need. These are small mustard seed acts of the kingdom that are going to grow into something beautiful. Friends, this is creation 2.0, and you have a role to play in it. While Mary begins in a place of grief, she leaves with hope. Her eyes are open to a profound new spiritual reality, and she is given a new identity and a new purpose. And this all happened 
It all hinges on her turning to Jesus. Verse 14, there's this fulcrum in this text. Mary turned around and saw Jesus. And the invitation I want to give to you, friends, is that I believe Jesus wants you to turn towards him or return to him. And as we do so, I believe we're going to see a deeper reality. You know, throughout this Lenten season, we've been looking at the I am statements of Jesus. Jesus has been been declaring who he is. And this culminates in, in this last I am statement where Jesus says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then notice the question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Will you put your faith in this? Step out trusting this. We've spent this Lent hearing about Jesus and what he's like, and I want to end our journey with this question. Do you trust this? Will you step out in faith even though maybe things are blurry and you're struggling to make sense of it all? Will you turn towards Jesus? As you do so, friends, I trust that God will show you a deeper story speak over you a new identity, and give you a new purpose. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this hope of of this Easter story and how you met Mary in grief, and she found a deeper source of hope. I pray that you might do that work even here now in our midst, that you might meet those of us who are struggling, who are, are struggling to see, who are grieving, and that you might open our eyes, Lord, to a deeper hope through it all. Lord, may we turn and see you in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.